for a suite of technologies that could uh, improve, uh, you know, GDP per BTU by, you know, two percent per year as opposed to one percent. What impact that would make between uh, now and, and 2050? I think if we had one simple answer and it was this unbelievably plentiful source of energy and we knew how to get it, we probably wouldn't worry too much about the efficiency and conservation part. But everything I've heard through this meeting and other places is that we don't really have that answer. We're going to be having to attack this problem from many sides. And, and I think the conservation and efficiency side is going to be uh, an important contributor in it. And it's just as you say, Tom, it's going to be a number of different things. It isn't a single technology, but, but it's a number of technologies that can make collectively an important impact. Well, thank you and good afternoon. It's certainly a privilege to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> something that's a little bit different than uh, what we've heard so far. I'm going to try to address the first order interaction between uh, nanoscience and energy. And this, this is motivated by the fact that one of the things that happens in, in when we spatially confine materials is that the energy states of energy carriers change. And uh, that can have uh, some profound uh, implications for energy conversion and uh, particularly posed in the context of efficiency. Uh, a lot of what I'll talk about is, is a little bit pedagogical. Um, and I hope you'll stay with me because I'll give you a carrot. I'll, I'll end up violating the second law of thermodynamics by the end of this. So uh, we can look forward to that. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll talk about some direct energy conversion technologies that exist. So, so there certainly are some interesting things happening in uh, nanoscale energy conversion and uh, things that are, are certainly of interest to, to this audience, I believe. And then I'll talk about uh, electron emission processes, which is uh, certainly in, in my area of expertise, and talk about how those processes can potentially be used to affect uh, improved energy conversion. And then I'll wrap it up, and I promise to stay within my time. So if we uh, think about short-term opportunities in direct energy conversion, uh, we, first of all, the, the direct thermal to electrical and vice versa energy conversion is appealing from an engineering standpoint. It eliminates moving parts, and I probably don't need to tell any of you that it's been horribly inefficient for years and years and, and continues to be so. Uh, but there are some niche opportunities in the short term, uh, certainly the military, NASA, uh, space ex exploration opportunities exist. Uh, electronics cooling, which is historically kind of where I come at the problem from, uh, and, and so forth. In the longer term, not necessarily the, the long term, the century term that we're talking about, uh, we could think about topping cycles for uh, fossil fuel plants, bottoming cycles for fuel cells, and so forth. Some recent work uh, by a group at Research Triangle Institute has shown that we can use nanoscale structures to significantly improve thermoelectric performance. And so we see uh, in this graph that uh, in, in using different materials, and this is mostly historic materials, that looking at, at taking, uh, again, these super lattice uh, materials of 10 angstroms and 50 angstrom layers of traditional uh, semiconductor materials, they can achieve a ZT of 2.4. Now, if you don't know what ZT is, I'm not going to explain it to you, but it's a figure of merit that uh, takes efficiency out of, the, out of the equation. You can convert it to an efficiency, and I'll talk about that. So for a long time, ZT stood at 1, a value of, of 1, which made thermoelectrics not very useful in general. Maybe you put them in the Coleman cooler. Uh, because people are willing to, to pay for that, uh, that convenience, but generally not applicable. Now, this, this ZT of 2.4, I should note, is uh, 
only in one one side of the of the thermocouple. So the other side, the end side, would was about 1.7, which means that the ZT of a device that operated on using this material would be around two, uh, and and that doesn't even put this material up to the level of vapor compression refrigerators, room temperature vapor compression refrigerators. And so it's, it's certainly not a, uh, a killer app, so to speak. But it's very encouraging. And you think, well, what about making it more nano? Would that help? And, and you think about the, the size, the, the length scales of these super lattices. You know, one of those, the, the bismuth telluride layer is already 10 angstroms. There's not a lot of room at the bottom anymore. Um, so the, the, uh, the point here is that certainly there could be significant materials developments and using different materials. But essentially, the, this, this uh, material operates on the principle of allowing significant electron transport while interfering with phonon transport. At least that's what, that's what people think. And so making things smaller may not help. In fact, when they went to uh, the, the 50 angstrom layer, made that smaller, it didn't always make anything better. So making it smaller is not always better. Uh, and then there's nanowires. You can, you can apply the same kind of principles to nanowires. Um, and, and Millie Dresselhaus in, in the early 90s uh, promoted a theory on that. And people certainly still are working in that area. Um, I'm going to talk about electron emission. And I told you we'll do a little bit of educating. And, and the only real things that I want you to take from this is that uh, when we shoot electrons out of a material, we're essentially filtering them by their energy in some way or another. If we heat up the material sufficiently, we can get them uh, just to, to exceed a potential barrier. This uh, symbol phi represents a work function. And so if we heat up the material enough, then a fraction of the electrons will just come out of the material. That's thermionic emission. If we apply an electric field, then we can get a fraction of the electrons to tunnel out of the material, and that's called field emission. And I'll talk about both of these uh, today. One thing to note is that this, the tunneling probability is very, a very strong function of that barrier width. And so if we can play around with the barrier width, then uh, we might be able to filter the energy a little bit better. One way that we can change the barrier width is by going to very small emitter materials. And, Back in 1968, uh, Spint did this and made spint emitters, uh, where essentially if you make this, this radius of the, of the emitter around 10 nanometers, you get a very profound increase in the, in the uh, electron emission. And the reason for that is that you took what was a linear uh, field, a linear potential profile between the cathode and the anode, and you uh, concentrated the field near the source of electrons and allowed them to tunnel out. Well, why is this important? If we uh, take a, a variety of different materials and uh, ask them all to produce 10 amps per square centimeter, which is what this graph represents, uh, we can look at how, what, what the potential field looks like to produce that kind of, uh, of uh, uh, current density. And so we have R equals infinity here. That's sort of the baseline. That's a, that's a planar emitter. And we get to 100 nanometers, and the profile hardly changes at all. 50 nanometers, not much. Then 20, it starts to change. And when we get down to about 5 nanometers, that potential profile has changed dramatically. Remember, all of these produce the same current density. Well, we can probably surmise just from that graph that even though the current densities are the same, the energetic distribution of the electrons that come out uh, are probably significantly different. So. Uh, if we look at this, and it looks like the, uh, let me see if I have to click something. No. Okay. Well, this was supposed to be a, a very simple animation. If we apply a low electric field, then we can get electrons to emit above the Fermi level, uh, and they are replaced, and that's the, the thing that's missing here. The replacement electron comes in around the Fermi level. If we apply a higher field, then the average energy of, of emitting electrons is going to be below. If we think about the top case just for a minute, uh, in that case, we will actually be cooling the emitter because we're, we're getting rid of, of high energy electrons and replacing them with lower energy electrons. And indeed, uh, the predictions suggest that that's what happens. If we look at 
two different work functions. That's, that's the only difference between these graphs. And then a variety of different uh, emitter radii, 10, 25, and 100 nanometers. We actually predict ridiculous energy fluxes, cooling rates from these materials, right? Uh, now, this is a work function of one electron volt, and that's uh, itself a stretch because most materials, certainly metals, have work functions uh, that are about four times greater than that. Uh, but there are some indications that we can get to low work function materials, something more realistic and, and based on a diamond carbon uh, material uh, would be 1.7 electron volts. And even then we get to high energy fluxes. Well, is this important? It certainly could be in an application sense. Uh, high, high rates of cooling are important and uh, uh, I think of interest to the, uh, the energy industry in general. Now I'm going to talk about, switch gears a little bit and talk about the first kind of emission, the thermionic emission. And what I'll say here has to do with uh, or relates to actually a little bit of doodling that I've, I've done over the last semester uh, in teaching a course at Purdue on, on nanoscale energy transport uh, and, and came up with a surprising result that, that I've already previewed a little bit. So if we think about thermionic emission, uh, we have... Uh, a, uh, first of all, a little history. Edison, like many things, he was the first to really observe it. Then it was quantified by Richardson in 1912. So it's been around a long time. Essentially, what we want to do with thermionic power generation devices is to boil electrons off a surface and catch them, and then send them through a circuit or through a load and, and uh, recycle them and so forth. Uh, the thermionic devices have not seen widespread use, and the reason has to do with the fact that, first of all, the work functions are so high of many materials that um, we have to operate at very high temperatures, around 2,000 Kelvin, and not very many ancillary materials want to cooperate at those temperatures. And, uh, but it can be particularly efficient. So in theory, thermionic uh, devices can be, if there's a lot of engineering that has to go into it, can be reasonably efficient if we can minimize uh, backward radiation if we can minimize heat conduction losses and line losses uh, in the electrical circuit. This is the way that a thermionic device would work. We heat up a cathode, and electrons in the cathode would have to be excited uh, above, the Fermi above the chemical potential uh, all the way over through vacuum or vapor. Sometimes we put vapor in here to minimize space charge effects and lower work functions. Uh, and then they land on the anode side. Now, there's also a reverse current. That's going to be important in, in, in a minute. There's a reverse current from the anode to the cathode because there's, uh, there's no way to stop these electrons if they have, the, have sufficient energy. But we keep the anode at a cooler temperature, so there are fewer electrons moving across. Now, um, if we think about this, basically... In this diagram, the difference between the chemical potentials on the two sides represents the amount of voltage that we'll generate, and then the amount of power that we have is the, voltage, the product of, of voltage and current. Well, that's, that's the 3D picture. And what if we confined the emitter? What if we spatially confined the energy states of the emitter? What would happen? So I have, have the 3D cube and the 1D uh, quantum wire. In three dimensions, I get a typical parabolic energy distribution. So we think of K as, uh, as the, wa the wave, wave vector. That's continuous. Um, in one dimension, though, I'm going to confine the lateral dimensions. And so what, hap what's, what, what can happen in this case is it's kind of like add when I add energy, when I heat up this material, in the 3D case, it's kind of like adding energy to a balloon. Uh, force times distance, I'm going to push the balloon in, it's going to spread out in, in all three directions. In the case of the quantum wire, I'm going to add energy to this, and it's like a straw. I squeeze the straw, and almost all the energy goes up. Uh, and if I align this quantum wire in the direction that I'd like to see uh, emission occur, then uh, we, we might expect that the thermionic emission performance would change. So the important thing here, it's a little bit technical, but not too bad, I hope, 
is the, the electron supply function. So we want to look at, this is the number of electrons that hit the emitting surface per unit time, per unit area, per unit energy. And uh, we look at this. I, I actually have a fairly large energy scale here because we, we still are interested, even though the supply function is much lower for high energies, we, st we still are interested up here because the work function may be that high. Uh, I, in the inset, we look at the, uh, the different curves, and now these curves correspond to different sizes of quantum wires, one, two, and four nanometers, and also the three-dimensional result for, for a bulk material. And we see that for one nanometer, um, for a one nanometer quantum wire, we actually are promoting energy in the direction that we want, um, more so than, than we are in the in the two and four nanometer cases. They look more like the bulk material. And I should have mentioned that that this energy, this this supply function, uh, represents W is the energy associated with momentum in the direction that I want to emit. So. If my supply function is greater for a quantum wire at the same temperature, uh, then I would expect I'd have more thermionic current. So as an engineer, you think, can I devise a device that, that might use this effect? So if we now think about uh, this toy example. So this is the example that, that I just came up with for my class recently. Um, we have an array of closely packed nanowires, quantum wires, sitting on some base. And, and that base probably is pretty important, but, but we'll, we'll ignore it right now. Um, and then we have a bulk emitter. Well, the reason that we don't want to put the nanowires on the bulk emitter is that we really don't want the electrons to go back the other way. So now I have a system, and, and I'm keeping these things both at the same temperature. The second law of thermodynamics says that if the temp hot and cold temperatures are the same, that we have zero efficiency, right? Uh, but I told you before that actually that supply function was larger for the quantum wires, and if I could find a way to make them very dense on the surface, here's, here's some uh, aligned carbon nanotube array that, that's multi-walled nanotube array that we, we grow in my lab, then uh, we could get a net current, right? And if we change the generated voltage, that's the difference in the, in the chemical potentials, then we could... Uh, then we could have actually power generation and define some kind of thermal efficiency, which looks like it's, you know, 30 or 40 percent for an isothermal system. Well, this doesn't make much, uh, it doesn't make me feel very good. Um, but it, so, so we need to think, is this notion even possible? Um, the concept is similar to what's been historically known as Maxwell's demon. And, and this is a, a situation where if you take uh, a container full of hot, uh, binary, of binary particles, hot and cold, and put a lossless shutter in between. And if you're smart enough to recognize that a hot particle is going, in this case, uh, from right to left, then you open the shutter, let it through, vice versa for the cold, then you could separate the, hot, the highly energetic particles from the, uh, the uh, lower energy particles and you would violate the second law, although it's not so obvious that you, it's not obvious where that that loss comes from. I mean, this is a lossless shutter. You have to go. It, the best explanation for why this violates the second law, you have to revert back to information theory, and I, I don't have time to go through that. But the question that I pose is: Can these nanomaterials act as Maxwell's shutter? And I don't know for sure. I'm not going to say no or yes with any certainty. Um, but it's certainly something worth thinking about. Why, why wouldn't it be true? Uh, I, I'm a skeptic. I'm, I, I'm an engineer, but uh, also pretend to be a scientist sometimes, and, and so I have to be skeptical. Um, and, and so we have uh, the, uh, the nature of interfacial transport from three dimensions to one dimension. That's at that, that base uh, electrode that I had in the previous diagram. There, could, there certainly is a lack of understanding about transport between those two. Uh, my friends who do molecular electronics, carbon nanotube, uh, field effect transistors, they don't understand charge transport very well, and they, they confess this readily, uh, between a bulk emitter and a nanotube. And that's just counting particles, that, let alone the energy transfer processes. So 
that certainly is, is a place where we could find a violation or where, where all of this could fall apart. Interactions among the quantum wires, internal losses, and so forth. So the answer is probably not, but I'm also an optimist, and I say it does suggest that we might be able to approach the second law limits differently than we do with bulk materials, and, and that's uh, a place where we can maybe hang a hat. Uh, just to wrap up, I promise to be done in time, we're, we're doing experiments on this uh, where we are measuring the energy distribution of emitted electrons, both by field emission and uh, by thermionic emission. I won't go into too many details about this, but certainly we see some evidence uh, from very small tip emitters. Uh, these are from diamond. Both of these are, are actually nanocrystal and diamond materials where we see shoulders in the distribution. In this case, this may or may not be real. It was somewhat repeatable. And then down here, go, we can actually get to very finely resolved energy distribution measurements, and we're, we're in the process. We've been doing these for only about a month um, of ferreting out the experimental noise from, uh, from what might actually be physically true. So uh, to wrap it up, I think the the prospects for energy conversion, the convergence between nanoscience and energy conversion is, is a strong one. Uh, right now it's in niche markets. I think that's a great place for it to be because that gives it a chance to develop. Um, I think that the discovery of nanoscale materials uh, is a continuous process, will be a continuous process. In, in our case, you know, we're looking for low work function materials and, and ways to do that. And we think that nanotechnology can actually help there. Um, there are so many challenges, and, and I'll just reiterate what Terry said. Scaling up from small scales to maybe not very large scales, but reasonable scales mic from nano to micro uh, is, is going to be critical. And uh, with that, I will uh, end my talk and take any questions. Again, a question while we switch over? If only for entertainment value, uh, doesn't your your little mechanism there also violate just plain old energy conservation? If the electrons go around the circuit and do some work, and then uh, come back and it looks like just like it looked before? No, no. There's still there's still energy exchange processes that um, thermal. There's a thermal element to this. The whole circuit cooled. Right. Okay. Right. Electrical grid, Dr. John Stringer, effort. Thank you. Pleasure to see you all here. Pleasure to be here myself, actually. The um, yesterday somebody remarked that. Um, they had only heard about this meeting fairly shortly before the meeting started, and uh, I had, I, on the other hand, had heard from Rick about this meeting quite a while ago. I didn't, however, discover the topic I was supposed to talk about until I saw the program, which is, uh, <laughs> which was interesting. My own field is uh, is in originally anyway in materials. I did a lot of my work in high temperature materials, consequently in the Electric Power Research Institute. I've spent a lot of time related to issues that are concerned with the efficiencies of uh, thermal uh, supply systems. And um, I was also, of course, at one time a quantum mechanic, and uh, that's where I started out. So that I've been interested in some of the, certainly some of the devices of lower um, dimensionality recently. And um, then I've been involved in uh, biomimetics, looking particularly at the enzyme catalysis of uh, CO2 capture systems and things like that. Consequently, I think it must have been somebody's puckish humor that decided to have me talk here about grids. Um, let's see which one of these, um, uh, which one is this? Oh, good. Uh, so that the, uh, let me talk first of all about the, uh, the information that's available to us 
Let me say something about the grid first of all in quite general terms. Uh, making electricity, oh yes, energy and electricity. I, a lot of what we've talked about is energy in general terms, but uh, let me say that one of the earlier speakers remarked that um, uh, the most, the, what we expected to see was an increase in the fraction of energy that's, that's electricity. And uh, I certainly think that's true. In fact, the policy of our in institute is uh, electrification of the world, by which they mean an increase in the fraction of the total energy use in the world that's provided by electricity. I'm aware of the arguments for and against that, and I'm also aware of the significant energy areas like transportation, like personal transportation, some forms of transportation where the electricity is not going to offer, offer you a great deal. But by and large, for most other processes, uh, electrification is, generally speaking, a good thing. However, <clears throat> when you generate electricity, you have to take it from where you've generated it and deliver it to the uh, people who are going to use it. There are conspicuous efficiencies associated with the size of generation plant. Consequently, if we're looking at uh, efficiencies overall in a global sense, it helps to make things fairly big. Uh, big, in this case, as you've heard several times, for a power generation system is around about uh, um, a gigawatt. So that, uh, that's the kind of size. Could we increase it? Yes. We could go, go up to probably about two gigawatts and have done that on occasions, but it's, that's about all. And uh, Nate, I think, remarked on the things that mean that this is the kind of unit that we deal with. So that, um, however, they're still fairly large uh, units, and uh, we then have to take the power and supply it elsewhere. Let me say one other thing, too. The, the electricity is strange. It's not exactly like gasoline. If I, I can get gasoline from somewhere and I can put it in a tank in principle and then take it out when I want to use it. We generate electricity, essentially, as you use it. With the, if you'll allow me to describe the speed of light as infinite, you realize that these two things are, are connected instantly. And that presents some rather interesting issues which haven't actually been mentioned very much. There was one slide in, the, in uh, just two, two speakers ago. Uh, and um, a fusion presentation, in fact, which actually had a, a curve on it which showed some of this, and that is that I, uh, if I'm going to generate electricity, having a thousand megawatt station does not mean it's going to generate a thousand megawatts. I have to have enough generation capability within a country like the United States to provide the absolute maximum that you want plus a margin. The margin is for various practical reasons and we don't need to talk about it. But you realize that for much of the time, the actual use of electricity in this country is way below that. So that consequently, we have a term called the utilization factor, term you haven't heard so far. The utilization factor tells you how much of the, of the plant that you build is actually being utilized in normal, successful operation. And it's around about, you know, 60% or thereabouts. So in other words, we have a significant amount of overcapacity in the system uh, in, for most of the time. That has an effect, that has a significant economic effect, you understand. When we talk about the cost of building a power plant, and you say a power plant to build costs so many, uh, so many dollars, and then fuel costs and so forth. The fuel costs, to some extent, will diminish once you stop using it. Uh, the, the money continues, of course, to run out of the barrel, nonetheless. So that the uh, capacity factor, the utilization factor, I should say, has to be taken into account in economic discussions. This is related to my topic, by the way. Um, so anyway, once I do this, you can appreciate that the more efficiently I can distribute the energy around, probably the less margin that I'm going to require uh, for the whole thing. The um, grid study, the, I put this up because this is the US, US Department of Energy's recent report. It's quite a hefty report. It's a national transmission grid study, and I suggest you look at it. We've been operating at EPRI on what we call the, the uh, elec electricity technology roadmap. Um, and these, this is the road behind, by the way. Um, my, I need a 
pointer? Where was the pointer? Oh, well. The, um, I'll just generally indicate where these things are. So that those, are the, those are our destinations in our roadmap. And you'll see right at the bottom there, number one, we need to resolve the power delivery vulnerability. And that's essentially the basis for what we're going to be talking about. As we update the roadmap, which is what we're doing right now, we have the, uh, we're going to reflect changes in the energy industry, reflect advances in science and technology. Uh, and then we're also at this moment looking at the, what we call the difficult challenges, which must be met to achieve those destinations, and then define the integrated technology development uh, that's going to be required for this. Now, I've listed what we are difficult challenges, and you, do only, you only need to read the ones in red because they're the ones that relate to the grid system. We need to improve the transmission capacity, grid control, and stability. We need to improve power quality and reliability for precision electricity users. And we also need to look at what we, ha we have to do for what's called the creation of the infrastructure of a digital society. Code for all that seeds, by the way. So that um, those are things, and they're related. The changes that I talked about before are related to the changes that are associated with the development of a, of a digital society. And this is particularly re relevant to the overall grid system. Um, these are the those specific difficult challenges, transform the grid into smart, electronically controlled network to increase throughput while decreasing vulnerability is the short term for that. And um, the capability gaps associated with this involve the regional and national plans for grid expansion, I'll come on to that just a bit more, wide area measurement and monitoring systems, and uh, facts, FACT stands for um, Flexible AC Transmission Systems, uh, Devices and Hierarchical Controls. This is, a, this is a solid state method of controlling these really rather prodigious amounts of uh, energy. Uh, we're using, we were interested in post-silicon power electronics and uh, complex interactive adaptive controls. And it's really, th these are the points, many of these situations here are where we're starting to get involved in things where you'll see that nanotechnology is going to be able to make contributions. And we need fully automated TND control systems. Tran TND, transmission and distribution. Sorry, I uh, hate acronyms where I'm not once not speaking to the same audience one's used to. Transmission is the big things that go out from the generating stations uh, along the wires that are stretched over the country and that everybody hates. And distribution is the thing that uh, takes the electricity from uh, 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 transformer stations near, nearby where you live and deliver it to your homes with overhead wires across all the streets that everybody hates. <laughs> the, um, the improved power quality, the second of those challenges, has uh, things connected with interconnection standards and integration guidelines for distributed resources. Distributed resources is the business that's been coming out recently where instead of having very large generating stations, we look at the possibility of having smaller generating units, which could be as small as a generating unit for one house, but more typically the ec economics start to look better if we're looking for areas um, or particular places where the, where the requirements are uh, more specific. And that's called uh, distributed generation. I'll come on to more of this. But if you, in terms of costs, if you're going to put in, supposing you decide you want to go in for distributed generation, you are tired of your local electricity company. You're not satisfied with the performance you're getting. And down at Sears, you can buy a little generator which you can put in. If you put that in and you're generating electricity for yourself, that's at one point a distributed generation unit. However, if your Sears generator cuts out, you expect, nonetheless, that the lights will still come on. In other words, you're going to be connected to, the, to the, uh, your, your local utility.
Now you think that that's no problem because what's it costing the utility while you're not using that electricity? What it's costing you is what I told you about before. Every, all of the physical equipment is still there. It still requires maintenance. And the fact that you want that energy when your local diesel cuts out implies that that demand is going to be ha has to be satisfied instantly by your local utility system. Having that capability to respond instantly is expensive. So that putting, it, putting the local generator in for yourself does not in fact save anybody any money at all. It may put, save you some personal money, but that's because you're trans transferring the expense to somebody else, probably the guy next door to you. And if the guy next door to you has got a generator, don't forget that. Then there's the creation <coughs> for the digital society. Um, a lot of this concerns, and the first item on this list, of course, is more or less the corollary of that. There is a lot to be said for distributed generation. Don't, don't think that I was passing that off. I'm not. But I, and I think distributed generation, it plays an important part in optimizing this whole system, which is what we need to do. And, uh, but what we need to do is to make sure that the DC, the, the um, distributed generation system, I should say, uh, the microgrids or whatever, are, architect, uh, are integrated into the uh, overall grid architecture. And that can only be done by very responsive uh, control systems. In other words, we're looking at a much more intelligent uh, overall uh, system than we've ever been used to in the past. Um, I'm going through these items fairly quickly for obvious reasons. And, uh, but, and if you ask, have questions about any of them, just ask me later. These, uh, this just differentiates the, the uh, plants that I've already told you about, essentially. But it tells you the kind of way we look at it. Um, the large generation uh, plants, the moderate-sized generation plants with an area, which we call the mini-grid, and uh, then small generation plants for a single user. And the, uh, it's the first two that we're really concerned with. This is just to give you an idea of the things we're talking about here. In the US at the moment, we have an installed capacity of 754 uh, gigawatts. And uh, the percentage of this that, um, at the moment is distributed generation, which means less than 20 megawatts a unit, is only about 7%. This is the, this is la this is the 2,000 figures, which are the last ones I have information for. The transmission is about uh, oh, over 230 kilovolts, by the way is around about 156,000 miles of line in this country. Uh, the transmission density, megawatts per mile, is about just a little under five. And the reliability at the moment is 99.99%. That's, in the jargon of the business, four nines. The electricity consumption is the number that you see there. You've seen it before, I think, this week. And uh, the Electricity intensity in terms of kilowatt hours per dollar goes to domestic product is that number. And uh, the load requiring digital quality power, that's to say the cleaner stuff, is at the moment around about 10% or slightly less. But by 2020, we expect uh, to see some changes in a, a couple of those numbers. The distribution part of it, that's to say the mini grids and so forth, will increase to perhaps 25%. The transmission density, uh, that's the loading on the, on the grid system, will go up from just under 5 to 5.6 megawatts per mile. And the amount requiring uh, digital quality power will go up from the present 10% or thereabouts to perhaps 50%. And uh, consequently, we are going for the very minimum to have to improve our transmission reliability increasing from four nines to five nines. The transmission systems were designed for the area of the 50s and 60s when it was mechanical switching and a radial network design. Um, don't bother about what radial network design is. Um, it's expected that we, uh, we need to grow the um, system. We would have to demand, we expect demand growth to go up by about 17% but before 2007. But in that same period, the transmission expansion is only going to go about 4% uh, because of delays in p getting things in place. And it's not very sexy, actually. So that um, 
cool somebody said about various things. Let me tell you that the transmission system is not cool. It's about as uncool as you can easily get in this business. Okay, so that... Um, However, just at the moment, the aggregate economic loss from power disturbances of all kinds comes to something like 1% of the gross domestic product. 1% doesn't sound like very much, but it's a heck of a lot of money. Ain't a terawatt. But then, of course, I don't talk terawatts, I talk dollars. The, um, and uh, the large, th this is a large number. It means that you all together are being... Um, you're having a cost for every single person of about $400 a year, but you don't know it because it's passed on to you by increased charges. That's what it means by saying par parasitic, the parasitic nature of the loss. The cost of unreliability looks, because of the neglect of the system, looks like going up something like that. Where did we, uh, did I touch two things at once? Yes, I did. All right. This is it. So it's going up something like that. And this is this I have to tell you is is uh, somewhat speculative, particularly the direction of the arrow, which is why the question mark is by it. So, you uh, but nonetheless, you can see that the the impact of these problems is likely to be real, really significant. That's the underlying problem, and I've already talked about that. For natural gas, the 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 pipeline, by the way, act, acts as the storage capability that you need for some of these things. In, uh, in chemical engineering parlance or uh, that kind of thing, that's you call it an accumulator actually, but in, in our system there's really very little chance for accumulators. Uh, the use of hydrogen in fuel, cell, uh, in fuel cell generators could offer this capability, again, by having a, um, a medium which, which ca contains within it a capacity inside the pipeline system of allowing that. Um, capac capacity limits on transmission is because the transmission line sags uh, as it gets warmer, and in the worst case, it can actually it can touch trees. That was the cause of one major disaster on the west coast not too long ago, and it can even contact the ground. And so, one way of increasing the capacity of existing transmission lines would be to increase the strength to reduce the sagging. We have a device called a sagometer now, by the way. <laughs> I said it wasn't cool. Okay. And uh, conductors with higher strength to weight ratios for given current carrying capacity may increase the uh, overall capacity on the right of way. And uh, that is something where, we, where nano strengthened materials are currently being looked at, in fact. So it's an actual thing for very large expenditures. Now, here's something really new. This is cool. And this is the Continental Supergrid. And. Uh, the general idea of this is we would have a DC superconducting line right across the country, lines across the country, using, uh, DC, using superconductors with liquid hydrogen as the coolant. And the general idea is you, you, as you pump the coolant in, you, know, you would eventually uh, uh, have to get the coolant out because it would evaporate a bit. So that that's being available as a trans transport system for hydrogen at the same time as supplying electricity losslessly. So you then can take it out of that line at wherever you need it and put it into the distribution system or into a local uh, transmission grid system. And uh, so that's, that's, the, that's, that's the really, that's the sexy thing. And this is fun. That's cool, very cool, 20 degrees Kelvin, get cooler than that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and that just tells you about the flexibility because of the pressure in the plane. So th this is the, the way things are going to change. This is what the grid of the future is going to have to look like. Major challenge is going to be to find ways of controlling the transmission system in milliseconds rather than multiple seconds that are used nowadays. And that uh, we have to have a whole looking at a new economy entirely about the, uh, the uh, having a number of open access transmission routes taking place, and we need to ensure that, poly that uh, the power follows what's called the contract path in this requirements, and that's, that's something which the next speaker may possibly have more to say about than I will here. Um, enabling technologies, sensors, electronic flow power control, real-time dispatch of distributed resources, 
uh, interference-free power line communications, DC micrograds for premium, premium power services, and digital devices with greater tolerance uh, to power disturbances. And uh, that has taken me to the end, onto the grid there, but it tells you what the, so the nanotechnology op options were all connected in the whole business of the need for this intelligent, uh, massive, enormous machine, the grid system, and the, what we're going to have to deal with to get, get ourselves into the next part of the, of the uh, century. Terawatts? Not exactly. But on the other hand, if we don't do those sorts of things, we're not going to have a viable place to dissipate our terawatts. <laughs> Thank you. Or two. One down there. Could you comment on what uh, the EPRI is doing to increase the efficiency of delivery to the consumer, specifically transformers, what I have in mind? Transformers. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, uh, because I had to, when I discovered my topic was grids, which is a fairly important thing, I realized I did dealt with the transmission system, not the distribution system, and the transformers. They're the interface, of course, between the, uh, between the, the uh, that. And the, the transformers that cause most troubles and cause you most troubles are often the very small ones that are sitting up in little cans above your backyard that everybody hates. Um, the, what we're trying to do with, with those is principally on the bigger transformers we've been looking at improving the efficiency of those. Originally we used to do that with the, with, with the introduction of uh, amorphous, amorphous materials, as you probably know, and both GE and Westinghouse turn out, still do, turn out fairly large transformers with, uh, with amorphous materials in, which is, I suppose, the ultimate conclusion of, uh, of uh, nanotechnology in that sense. The, the, the local correlations are one atom apart, so that um, that's about as far as you can get. Um, on the smaller transformers, the transformer itself is a fairly efficient, uh, a fairly efficient converter. The reliabilities are usually associated with cor corrosion damage. Frequently, these things are placed uh, placed where they're going to get uh, wet, and the corrosion can trouble things. We have the continuing joke type problems of having the insulation gnawed through by rats, um, and that kind of thing. What what did you have specifically in mind? Yes, the, he's saying that uh, one of the other speakers said there was a 5% loss in transformers. There's always going to be a certain amount of loss in transformers, and that's, that can be related to the way the, the way the transformer is designed. There are improved transformer designs. The improved transformer designs are t tend to be somewhat, on the, somewhat more expensive. Uh, the other thing is that the transformer is something you put in, and you generally don't bother about it for a long time. So a lot of the transformers are fairly old, old designs. We would like to replace them, but it's all connected with this business of the relatively small amount of money that we've, that we've been able to spend. It's not a matter for research. Um, real quick one here, and then we've got to move on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've always wondered why you don't put the local distribution lines underground, you know. Because especially in Houston, you know, we, we were tired, you know, of being without electricity after a hurricane for about three weeks. <coughs> you may detect that this is not a California accent. <laughs> I was brought up and educated in England. And in England, as you probably notice, and as in much of Europe, you don't see overhead. You don't see overhead distribution lines very much at all. It's all put underground. Uh, when the first thing that you notice when you arrive, when somebody from Europe arrives in the United States, the first thing, pretty well, is this network of stuff over your head. Uh, so why isn't it done here? It's really basically economics. It costs more to put the thing underground. It also routine maintenance, not not disaster maintenance, but routine maintenance, is also more difficult. 
if you put things underground, and there are many cities and districts, of course, in the United States where things are put underground uh, by reason of local action. And in that particular case, uh, if there is a, prob a, prob a line problem somewhere or other, then, uh, then maintaining it is, is significantly more difficult. The, um, there is, um, there's, are some problems if you get any of the higher voltage stuff put underground because of the variability of the of the heat carrying capacity of the local ground, but that's not what you asked about. The, um, but, but it's mo mostly economics. If you want it put underground, vote for it and they'll put it underground. <laughs> Thank you, John. Kay. Okay, yeah. Do I have, oh, now it's okay. Um, I'm going to follow on from the previous discussion, uh, talk a little bit specifically about high voltage direct current transmission. And uh, given the uh, time involved, I'm going to try and edit on the fly and <laughs> uh, do this as quickly as possible. Um, let's see. Whoops. <laughs> We seem to have a problem here with our machine. Yeah, I think that's right. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually editing it for me. <laughs> uh, it's skipping a few slides. Um, so I, I don't know quite exactly what, what's happened with the, the system. Uh, but um, uh, the first few slides were talking about uh, uh, some of the uh, reasons why we've had a bi big increase in high voltage direct current transmission uh, in recent years. Uh, and part of the story is technological uh, innovation, which uh, has uh, made uh, direct current much more uh, economic relative to uh, AC than it used to be. Uh, mainly that's uh, been the development of um, uh, so semiconductor technologies that have uh, improved the efficiency or the, of conversion between DC and AC. But it's also a function of the change in the economic environment. Uh, and the economic environment has been one that, as we've moved towards deregulated electricity markets, uh, where there's been uh, a, 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 the opportunity to take advantage of delivering power to uh, other distributors' uh, areas, take advantage of pri arbitrage price differences. So that's increased the benefits of transmitting power long distances. And that's uh, encouraged the development of uh, high voltage direct current uh, transmission. Uh, and uh, this uh, slide here was meant to illustrate one of the big, uh, one of the savings of uh, direct current versus uh, alternating current is that you have uh, much smaller towers. So uh, this is for a 2,000 megawatt uh, capacity system, typical tower right away. You can see that the direct current tower on the top left. So if I can also figure out this. So this one here is, is a, it, for direct current you only need two wires. The equivalent AC system for equivalent reliability is going to have six wires. Uh, and so it takes up a lot more land. This is the, the width of the right of way, 50 meters versus 85 meters. Land is of course uh, also an expense and you want to economize on, on the use of land. Uh, and uh, so that's a significant factor that makes the direct current um, uh, preferable to, to the AC for transmitting over long distances, something that reduces uh, the cost. Uh, on, on the other hand, the, you've got the cost of conversion to and from AC. Uh, you don't want to supply houses at very high voltages, of course, so you've got to, you've got to transform the power to lower voltages. There are costs involved in building the converter stations. So uh, there's a trade-off between the extra capital cost of the conversion stations uh, relative to the trans transformer yards and so on in the AC system. Uh, versus the lower cost of building the line. Uh, and so that's one thing that makes the, the direct current uh, preferable for long distance transmission. Uh, another major use, let's see if this, uh, hmm, <laughs> where's the, uh, my, uh, my assistant? Looks like I'm only gonna get to, to show one slide here. Let's see.
it's not going to be very helpful if I only get to show one picture. Could you could you try the um, the uh, Acrobat version might work better. Next one down. Mm -hmm. You want to try it? Yeah, let's try it now. Oh, um. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do you got the power cord? Can't find the power. Okay. All right. So uh, Microsoft failed us, but Adobe has saved us. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Yeah. Whoop. Oh, there we go. So this is some of what I said uh, that we had. We had uh, semiconductor developments. Uh, uh, developments in semiconductor uh, technology that's helped uh, promote a high voltage direct current transmission. Uh, and I was also mentioning there are some economic factors that have encouraged the use of it, the development of these uh, power markets. Um, and uh, as part of the development of power markets, uh, we now have people you know, writing contracts for the provision of transmission services, which requires that we have more stable networks and stable transmission patterns. Uh, also, with power markets, we have uh, bi-directional power transfers. Uh, they're often needed, so it means uh, power going one direction for certain hours of the day, the opposite direction uh, another time of the day. And uh, these are, can be accommodated at much lower cost with high voltage direct current. As you can tell uh, from my accent, uh, now unfortunately the picture is, is messed up, uh, this is uh, from an Australian electricity market, which actually the World Bank uh, has uh, commented as one of the best uh, electric market reforms. But of course, I chose it for other reasons, partly because where I come from, out of interest. But one thing you'll notice here is the blue is actually, uh, this is going to come back later, the blue is the cycle in the demand for, for power, and the green is the wholesale market price. And the actual picture, if we could see it, had up here dollars uh, or cents per kilowatt hour. And one thing you find is people were talking about um, the differences in, or the, the, how these different technologies have different power costs. Uh, that's true. Uh, here, the, the uh, wholesale price of electricity is moving quite a bit in this green curve. Uh, what happens here is, uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, as you go to certain times where the power demand is high, where the blue here is peaking, you uh, you get a spike in the uh, wholesale market price. And what's happening is you're using technologies to generate electricity here, which are used at a, uh, the the plant is used over a very short period of time, uh, and so uh, very high. The, the, the capital cost is very low, very high operating costs, usually high fuel costs, and that raises the price. Uh, but you also have a lot of some price smoothing here, you can see, which I want to also come back and talk about. Another thing that this illustrates, if we had the actual price up, is that the price varies in different regions. So the, the power solution for one part of the world may not necessarily be a power solution for another part. And in particular, one thing that's true here in Australia, one re another reason for picking the Australian case, is that these numbers here are very, very low. Uh, on the order of a couple of cents a kilowatt hour only, uh, which in that case is based on a lot of uh, coal generating capacity. Uh, then as I mentioned, or started talking about, uh, there's, if you wanted to compare the cost of AC versus DC, uh, as I just had the picture up a while ago, DC requires uh, smaller uh, towers for transmission towers, has less losses, less power losses for the, an optimized system, uh, requires less insulation. And uh, as a result here, and on the other hand, it has these extra cost of the terminals. So there's a crossover point where once you get to beyond a certain distance here, uh, this is in kilometers, so about 300 kilometers, uh, it's cheaper to use DC rather than AC. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we're having increasing use of, of high, high voltage direct current. And keep going along. We saw the picture on the, the right of ways. Uh, and here's the, the trade-off between the distance of the line versus the cost of the capital cost of the stations. 
Um, of course, in both systems, you trade the design characteristics trade off the fixed and variable costs. And so you talk about an optimized system, but because you have lower losses, you can actually afford to reduce some other costs and actually raise uh, the cost of losses uh, in the final system. So in the optimized system, uh, you wouldn't fully exploit all the losses, but what they do is they enable you to have a uh, lower cost of uh, the overall transmission system. And looks like we're having power problems again. Uh, the final point there is interest rates also affect this trade-off because you're trading off op operating costs with the capital costs. Uh, and here is another graph you can't see, but this is the break-even distance uh, of uh, typical break-even distances for, for AC versus C DC. This was the amount of power transmitted, and here's the distance along here. So uh, what happens is basically if you're transporting, uh, transporting more power, uh, the break-even distance is, is, uh, is larger. <laughs> uh, the other thing about the direct uh, high voltage direct current transmission is it's particularly suited to uh, certain kinds of specialized applications. In particular, it's very suited to undersea transmission where the losses from AC are larger. And another uh, important use of, of uh, direct current is back-to-back -back converters where uh, you want to connect two AC systems. For example, one's operating at different frequencies. In Japan, they have half the country runs on 50 hertz and half on 60 hertz. So the only way of transmitting power between the two halves is to convert to and from DC. Uh, and even in the United States, and let's see if this picture comes up. Well, half of it does, unfortunately. Uh, so in the US, basically, we have different transmission control regions. So here's the western region, here's uh, Texas, basically, ERCOT. And then uh, nearly all these other colors, except for Quebec, are all in one region. So they're basically four regions where the power uh, cycles are all synchronized. But between these four regions, they, they run asynchronously. So the only way of transferring power between these four major regions, Quebec, all everything east of the Rockies except for Quebec and Texas, Texas and the western system, is to use uh, direct current links. So there are a small number of direct current links. This picture over here showed you the direct current links. Um, so uh, because um, DC can transmit power between systems that are running even at different frequencies, or AC systems that aren't synchronized, the DC link's asynchronous, then uh, DC is actually has other uses. It helps actually control the AC system. And uh, so if, if or go back to, if we had that previous picture, you would have seen there's a few DC links that are within each of the regions in the US, and part of the function of those, those links is to help stabilize the AC system. And uh, we look at some of the earlier projects, uh, you can see what, where, DC is most, where DC is most useful. The earliest ones were submarine cables, where the advantage of DC is, is greatest. Uh, then uh, some of the earlier projects involved hydroelectricity, and I'm going to come back to that point. Uh, we've heard some, we heard some talk earlier today about the, the potential for using uh, hydro resources to help provide uh, energy. Uh, there's a simple issue comes up with solar energy, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and then this, this, some, of the, some of the earlier schemes were also there to help with the stabilization function. Uh, some of the uh, recent projects that people have talked about, uh, well, some of the one recently built ones, and then I'm going to talk a couple about a couple of uh, proposed ones. Uh, in South America, in uh, Brazil, there's a project uh, 6,300 megawatts transmitted uh, at 600 kV direct current. It's a two bipolar lines bringing power from the 50 hertz uh, Itaipu hydroelectric plant to Sao Paulo. In the Philippines, they have uh, 440 megawatt, 430 kilometer overhead DC line, includes 21 kilometers submarine link. Uh, that takes geothermal energy from uh, Leyte to the, to the main island of Luzon. Uh, in India, recent uh, DC project, 1,500 megawatts at 500 kV, uh, it's taking power 814 kilometers from a 3,000 megawatt coal-based plant uh, into Delhi. And one of the reasons for picking DC, again, is uh, stabilization and control issues, but also it halved the right-of-way cost have the, the land acquisition costs. Uh, some uh, big pr uh, proposed projects, there's this Neptune project in the northeast of the uh, United States linking the gas supplies in Nova Scotia to uh, 
Boston, New York City and New Jersey. 1,000 kilometres, 1,200 megawatt submarine cable. Uh, it's an alternative to transmitting the gas, so you avoid the NIMBY problem, not in my backyard, so the power stations can be built up in Canada, and the power ship, rather than putting the power stations in New York City, and also enables oil-fired plant in New York to be retired. Uh, another advantage of the DC link, again, here, is that it would help improve network stability. And then the other thing is you have these bilateral power trades. So with the DC link, you can ship power uh, in one direction in the summertime when there's the power demand's higher in the south, ship it north in the wintertime when uh, power demand's higher in the north. So DC has this advantage of the two-way direction for that. Uh, you can also compare a DC transmission with gas pipelines. The project we looked at recently at the Baker Institute compared the use of direct current transmission in Japan versus building a gas pipeline to use Sakhalin natural gas. Uh, and uh, the electricity option is quite competitive, particularly if you take account of these other benefits, that the stabilization benefits that the, the DC can provide. Uh, H high voltage direct current is particularly useful in renewable energy situations. As I mentioned, it's been used a lot for hydro schemes. Uh, it's also useful, and I mentioned the, the geothermal project in the Philippines. Uh, it's used in a lot of wind projects because the wind turbines generate power at different frequencies, so you want to convert to DC anyway. And for large hydro projects, often they supply power systems at different frequencies. And a particularly uh, useful application, I suggest, would be solar power. If you start to have grid-connected large uh, photovoltaic cell plants, uh, they're going to produce electricity as direct current. And uh, the DC would be particularly useful in that application because you wouldn't have to convert from direct current to, to alternating current. You could ship the DC to where you want to use it. And in uh, the United States, ah, so this one works. So he here's an example of uh, the potential electricity you could generate from photovoltaics. Um, this is taken from, uh, from a, a research institute for solar energy in Germany. Uh, and the red are the areas where you can uh, to get the most electricity from photovoltaics. And generally speaking, of course, the red corresponds with the desert areas. Uh, the world. Uh, that's also where land, of course, is quite cheap, but it's not where a lot of people live, so you've got to get the power from where you can uh, generate it to, to where people live. These areas, it, it's also, of course, as you go up in altitude, you can also produce uh, more electricity from, uh, from, volta, uh, from, uh, from photovoltaic cells. Uh, now, in the case of the United States, this picture shows uh, from the National uh, Energy Renewable Energy Labs gives you a picture of the average uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared per day in the United States. And down here, basically, this, is, uh, this, this uh, line here is six uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. So in the orange area, you've got b more than six. And if you do a little bit of arithmetic with that, if you, if you take it at six kilowatt hours per meter squared of light a day, that yields about 280 kilowatt hours per meter squared of electricity a year if panels are 13% efficiency. Uh, for average transmission distances of 5,000 kilometers, if you go back to the picture I had on, on transmission losses, high voltage direct current transmission losses would be about 25%. Do those calculations to replace uh, 3,800 billion kilowatt hours of electricity produced in the US in 2000, you'd need uh, basically 18,000 square kilometers of panels so that you can do that, for example, 20 panels, 30 kilometers by 30 kilometers. Uh, now, one thing you could do in the United States here is if you, you could put panels in this area, and if you had two direct current links, one to the east and one to the west, one advantage of that is, is that uh, you could uh, supply both California and Texas, and you'd also link California and Texas, much strengthen the connection between California and Texas, strengthen the connection of Texas to the rest of the grid, one of the reasons why California had problems when they had uh, supply constraints was that the, these connections between the west coast part of the grid and the rest of the grid are not very strong. So if you could strengthen those connections, uh, you would assist in uh, providing greater stability to the power system. Of course, you would have imported high electricity prices from California further east. The rest of us would have helped pay for California's problems. Uh, we could talk about, um, uh, I mentioned here some of the plants at the moment, there are about 25 plants worldwide producing uh, electricity using, uh, these are grid-connected photovoltaic cell plants. Uh, these things are 300 kilowatts to more than 3 megawatts, but remember I just had that station, power station, coal-based power station in India was 3,000 megawatts, so we've got a little while, while to go. 
Um, these plants have proved easy to monitor and control and have achieved 25% annual capacity factor. That's what the previous speaker was talking about, the percentage of potential energy that you could produce um, given the capacity of the plant relative to what it does produce. Now, in terms of seasonal fluctuations, if you look at this picture, one here is, is good, so the light blue. So one thing is you get in this southwest part of the United States, not only could you produce a lot of, this is good for producing electricity, it also would not vary very much from one season to the next. So the ratio of summer to winter power is actually close to one. So this is actually a very good uh, area for producing uh, solar-based electricity. Now the other thing you could do is, that people have proposed using high voltage direct current, is to ha produce electricity in places like uh, the southwest of the United States and ship it elsewhere. But the other thing you could do is you could connect up the continents with, different, with high voltage direct current links. And one of the advantages of doing that, if you if we go back to our, here, so here's a, a, this, the picture I had before of the daily fluctuations. This is spread out now over 20, so stretch the day, one day out. So uh, at night time, of course, you have much lower power demand than you do during the day. So this top point here is the original load curve. So that's the electricity you've got to supply. So as the previous speaker was pointing out, you need enough capacity to meet this peak, even though for a lot of the, the day, you're actually producing a lot less than that. And if you have solar output, one of the problems with solar output people talk about, of course, is it only generates while the sun's shining and these other hours of the day where you're not producing much. It would knock a hole in the load curve, so to speak, in the middle of the day, but you'd let, be left with these two peaks on the side. Uh, there are two things, two, two contributions that um, a high voltage direct current could make to that problem. One is if we could link in some hydro capacity, you could clip off these peaks, use the hydro, and then if you could combine the hydro actually with pump storage, so you actually pump water uphill when the cost of electricity is much lower. You notice my first picture where I had the prices of electricity. The price of electricity was much lower at night time. You buy the electricity here, pump the water uphill, and then at the time when it's the price of electricity is much higher, you, you run the electricity, they run the water through the generators again and generate electricity here. Now the big advantage of knocking a, a hole in the middle of the day here is that you need a lot less hydro capacity to clip these peaks. And if you combine then the pump storage raising demand at night, hydro lowering it, you get something that's much, and then solar in the middle of the day, you get something that's much closer to a uniform load curve, which you could then uh, satisfy with these other kinds of uh, technologies. Uh, the other thing though that you can do with high voltage direct current is if you put your solar plants in different uh, longitudes, these peaks won't all correspond. So when it's shining in the middle of the day in El Paso, uh, you know, it's gonna shine in the middle of the day a different time at, in, in Arizona. And so by combining these, you can have a much flatter generation uh, supply curve. And on the demand side, if you have more linkages between the different regions, you would smooth out these demand peaks. So if we have transmission between different regions, different climates, different uh, periods of the day, you could, uh, where the, you know, di different uh, time zones, you could uh, help solve uh, some of the problem by using the existing energy infrastructure much more efficiently. Uh, that's basically what that slide says. Uh, so this talks about the transcontinental energy bridges I mentioned. So uh, just a few facts here. Siberia has very large coal and gas reserves and could produce 450 to 600 billion kilowatt hours of hydroelectricity annually. So the pre there's a previous speaker who spoke about how much unused hydro capacity there really is. There is a lot of it actually in Siberia. Uh, that corresponds, to the hydro capacity alone in, in Siberia corresponds to about 45% of Japanese uh, electricity uh, output in 1995. Uh, and you could connect uh, Siberia with uh, Japan with an 1800 kilometer, 11,000 megawatt direct current link, which is not far beyond what you could do right now uh, with current technology. Similarly, in Zaire, in the Congo Basin, uh, it's estimated there are somewhere between 250 and 500 billion kilowatt hours of hydroelectricity annually, which you could send uh, to Europe, which would be a five to 6,000 kilometer link, uh, 30 to 60,000 uh, megawatts. And of course, there's also very large unused hydro resources in Canada, uh, but of course, there's opposition to building dams, which I guess is another matter. But uh, part of the story behind the so solar may be for extensive use of solar, you might want to have hydroelectricity capacity as a supplement to help fill in those peaks and troughs, like I mentioned. 
Uh, so for transfers of 5,000 megawatts or more over 4,000 kilometers, the optimum voltage that you want to use in your DC link rises to 1,000 to 1,100 kilovolts. Technological developments in converter stations will be required to handle these. So this is the point of where do you need some technological developments. On the other hand, lower line losses will reduce the optimum voltage. So if we could, uh, by uh, some nanotechnology or some other technology, greatly reduce line losses, that we can have these large power transfers over long distances. However, in opposition from environmentalists and unstable international relations, I suggest may be the biggest obstacle to these uh, transcontinental schemes. There's a, a whirlwind tour of uh, my package. As promised, I summarize. Could you comment on the impact of superconductivity to your DC grid uh, concept or DC transmission line concept? Uh, well, if you, I, I just said even if you don't have to go all the way to superconductivity, if you get lower line losses, then you can then you can uh, transport transport much more power uh, over longer distances. So uh, if you can reduce the line losses, either you know if you go all the way to superconductivity, uh, then uh, I imagine you could. Probably transport. I, I'm not sure about the, the te technology about that or what we could be, we'd be able to do. Another question over here. Yeah, you said, could I comment on wireless transmission? I'm sorry, I haven't looked into the, to any of the economics behind wireless transmission, so I'm not sure uh, uh, how, you, how that would compare. is in, uh, moving into transportation. The first is Ken Stroh from uh, Los Alamos National Lab, and we're moving into fuel cells. I'll try this one first. He went off to uh, change the battery in the, in the lavalier mic. Um, I, I need to explain the sign there to you. Except for the bottom line, uh, if you were to uh, drive from Texas to New Mexico on a surface road, you'd see a sign like that. Um, we added the bottom line because our new governor, Bill Richardson, is the former Secretary of Energy. Uh, along with being a TV commentator and uh, North Korean negotiator. And um, uh, Governor Richardson has uh, decided that fuel cells and hydrogen could be the source of a uh, technology cluster in New Mexico. And so uh, we actually had a, uh, a workshop in Santa Fe a couple weeks ago to look at that. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about transportation today. Um, that is what funds most of our activity uh, in fuel cells. Um, and that's true not only at our laboratory, but uh, in the United States, most of the fuel cell activity that's funded, other than the high temperature work for the fossil energy department, is oriented toward uh, transportation. Um, and for transportation, we're talking about low temperature fuel cells. What we're talking about is uh, fuel cells that use a uh, polymer for the electrolyte. So they're called polymer electrolyte membrane, or PEM fuel cells. Um, the nice thing about, uh, well, there's a couple of nice things. Having a solid electrolyte is nicer than having to, to manage a liquid electrolyte. Makes the uh, assembly simpler, more rugged, easier to put together, those kinds of things. Um, but also they operate at relatively low temperatures, 80 degrees centigrade in this uh, particular case, uh, which is good for systems that go up and down a lot. Uh, you start your car, you drive it a short distance, you shut it down. Um, the high temperature fuel cells that one would use for fossil fuels in a uh, stationary application, they like to go up to temperature and stay there. Uh, they have ceramic electrolytes and they need more careful temperature management. Um, the easiest way to think about a fuel cell without worrying about the details is that it's sort of like a battery except instead of having the chemical energy stored inside the case, uh, you're going to feed fuel to it from, from the outside, and as long as you feed it fuel, it's going to give you full output when you require. Um, and in this case, we're talking about fuel cells that run on hydrogen and oxygen extracted from the air. Um, you can run fuel cells on lots of different uh, chemical couples, but uh, 
this is the one that we're looking at, and the, the feature that you've heard about several times over the last couple days is that if you uh, do that, uh, at least at the point of, of power conversion, uh, the only emission is pure water. Um, typically, at, a, at an operating condition that you might want to operate at, a single cell would have a voltage across it of about 6 tenths or 7 tenths of a volt. And so in order to get a usable voltage for whatever application you're into, you stack cells together in series and the voltage just adds. And that's what you see over there in the, the other corner. Uh, that is an automotive fuel cell. It's about the size of a mid-sized suitcase. Um, and they typically run at uh, 300 to 400 volts. Um, and the power is then converted to uh, uh, three-phase AC to drive the traction motors. The other thing is, is at a particular operating condition, the uh, fuel cell will have a characteristic current density in the, in the other plane going this way, um, which is on the order at, at reasonable conditions of uh, maybe 600, 700 milliamps per centimeter squared. So again, a fuel cell like that in an uh, automobile might run at two to 300 amps. Let's see if this works here. A little animation of how a PEM fuel cell works. Um, if you take a stack and you take out a single cell and then you cut down into it and look what's in there and what's happening, you find it's sandwiched by two plates, which are separator plates that the gases are distributed across. And you put oxygen on one side of the plate and hydrogen on the other side of the plate, and it's called a bipolar plate. Uh, that way you can stack things together. If you then go further inside, uh, you've got hydrogen coming in here at the anode. Um, it's being oxidized over a platinum catalyst, and that's separating the molecular hydrogen into protons and electrons. Protons can go through the membrane, the electrolyte. Uh, electrons cannot. So the protons go across, combine with oxygen. The electrons coming from the opposite plate make water. The electrons flowing net left to right provide electricity, and you can series connect these things. And uh, that's how a fuel cell works in, in simple terms. If I get in a hurry and try to uh, speed it up, it gets unhappy with me. Um, fuel cells are nicely modular. You can use them at all these scales, everything from uh, uh, battery replacement and portable electronics up to stationary generation. As I mentioned, most of the, um, the work that we're uh, funded for is oriented toward the automotive application, or at least the transportation application. In a lot of ways, that's like doing the hardest problem first. It's got to be cheap, light, small. Uh, rugged, it's got to have a turn down of maybe 50 to 1, it's got to have a very fast dynamic response. Um, and that one is hard to do. And that's why when people talk about fuel cell vehicles, they're not talking about them being on the market right away. But as you make progress toward the goals that that market requires, a lot of these other things become enabled. And uh, what you find is down at the battery end, um, the thing that that gives you an advantage over batteries is the fact that you separate the power conversion from the energy storage. And if you need more energy, you can just add a bigger tank of fuel. And so you can get much longer ranges. And uh, I'll show you a couple applications of that. That doesn't make a big impact on things like greenhouse gases or, or primary energy source usage. But what it does do is it uses the same materials that you need in this device or this device. And so it starts the commercialization early. The other thing about it is. Uh, if you think about your cell phone, that battery is about one watt and costs about $100. That's $100,000 a kilowatt. So all of a sudden, the price bogey goes away, and now you're limited. You've got other problems. You've got to make it small and, and so on, but, uh, but you can do that. Um, so if you kind of break these things up, there's subwatts. Uh, a cell phone at, uh, at station keeping, when it's not transmitting, it uses a couple tenths of a watt. And some battery applications. Uh, you know, like wheelchairs are up to a few hundred watts. Uh, residential units that are being designed are typically one to 10 kilowatts. Uh, one kilowatt's kind of the minimum that your house typically sees. Um, seven kilowatts is kind of the peak. So different manufacturers are targeting different things, but if you want to sell power back to the utility, you'd be at the higher end, and if you just wanted to take care of most of the base loads, you'd be at the other end. Automotive. Uh, we used to think it'd be around 50 kilowatts, but now everybody wants a high-performance car, so they're talking about 120 kilowatts. Um, industrial for PEM fuel cells, 200 kilowatt units are being built. If you want to go up to these kind of units, you're probably using a solid oxide fuel with uh, 
with fossil fuels. Um, these things are still de developmental, they're still pre-commercial, and uh, you got to be careful about not equating press releases with technology advance. Just to give you a, a few quick examples, um, this is kind of the way the technology advances. We do a proof of principle at this kind of scale, and you can tell from the alligator clips, this is a big chunk of metal. Um, Motorola puts four of them on a chip, and this is where they want to end up, where these little cartridges would have dilute methanol in them. And it's kind of like what you put in your windshield washer uh, to keep it from freezing in the winter, about a buck a gallon at Walmart, but I suspect Motorola will sell these cartridges for quite a premium. But it might run your cell phone for a week. Here's the president making a uh, cell phone call with a fuel cell. What you can't really tell, and I don't know whether you can see it out there, the cell phone, he's got his ear, but the fuel cell is actually in his hand. There's a little wire running up there. So, um, you know, a, a little bit of a stretch. Um, another place where price is not the uh, bogey is in the military. The soldier of the future, he has really high power demands. He's got laser range finders. He's got satellite burst communications. He's got laptop displays that shows him where everybody is on the battlefield. He's got cooling vests in the desert and heating vests in the winter. Um, and it turns out that a direct methanol fuel cell um, is actually going to be named the uh, baseline power system for the objective force warrior. And there may be several hundred thousand of these things get built. Yesterday, it may have been Jeremy Rifkin talked about uh, GE selling home residential units. The thing I'll tell you is that the offer date and the price are to be determined. Uh, this was to have been a commercial product in 2003, and now the date is indeterminate. Uh, it turned out to be a little more difficult than they thought. But these kinds of systems would process either natural gas or propane to make a hydrogen-rich gas on demand. Um, then you have to clean up to make sure there's no carbon monoxide because carbon monoxide is a fuel cell poison. Um, has a built-in inverter and power conditioner and a waste heat interface. That's what helps in the residential application is that you can use the waste heat to uh, heat your home, heat your domestic hot water, those kinds of things. And if you do that, overall you can get like 75% useful energy out of the uh, input fuel. In a car, these are the kinds of things you need. Um, as you might expect, you need a fuel cell. You need either hydrogen storage or a way to make uh, hydrogen gas on demand. Uh, but you also need batteries. Uh, you need the traction motor. You need the power electronics that get everything going. Um, and fuel cells work best when they're uh, pressurized. So uh, most of these systems have an air compressor, although there are people that are working on uh, ambient pressure systems. The technology is such that you can actually fit it in a, a small vehicle and not even know that it's there. But the one thing that I need to point out is that in order to get enough hydrogen in this small vehicle, they went to a liquid hydrogen tank, which is probably not a viable commercial technology. Um, if nothing else, you have to use about a third of the uh, energy content of the hydrogen to liquefy it. Um, SUVs, we, we've heard uh, commented on the last couple of days. Um, one of the ideas behind Freedom Car, the Freedom Cooperative Automotive Research Program, is that you have freedom of mobility and freedom of vehicle choice. So you can choose to drive an SUV and be environmentally friendly as long as it's powered by a fuel cell. Um, almost exactly 100 years after the first coast-to-coast -coast crossing in the United States by an internal combustion engine vehicle, the first fuel cell vehicle crossed the country. Um, this one actually has a methanol reformer on it. Uh, methanol is pretty nice as a hydrogen carrier. Uh, it comes apart at low temperatures. It comes apart mostly into hydrogen and carbon dioxide, so you don't have to worry too much about CO. Um, I've driven this car, and I have to agree, Car and Driver magazine said it had uh, same-day acceleration. <laughs> so. um, this is kind of useful to think about, um, because there are some applications that, that we have been working on and that people are talking about that only make sense as a transition. And one of those is the gasoline reformer fuel cell, and I'll show you why. Um, the blue here is pump to wheels. So that's the energy that you use after you fill the tank to drive the car. The yellow is, is well to pump. So that's what it takes to get the, uh, the hydrogen or the fuel to the, uh, the point of distribution. So if this is the environmental effect of uh, some greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, grams per mile, of a current generation vehicle, a gasoline vehicle. 
This is with the, if you assume certain uh, improvements in uh, internal combustion engines like direct gasoline injection and that sort of thing. This is the uh, hybrid electric, um, like the Toyota Prius or the Honda Insight. And this is a gasoline fuel cell vehicle. You're not going to change the entire energy conversion system and, and maintenance and fuel distribution for that kind of benefit there. So the only reason you would do this is as a transition to get to, to a different place. And, and that may well make sense, but, but you have to realize why you're doing it. Uh, so those are all oil-derived uh, fuel forms. Um, the, the gas to liquids thing in an internal combustion engine is about the same. Um, if you make hydrogen from natural gas with a steam methane reformer at your local gas station, you do have a well-to-pump emissions because there's carbon uh, in the methane and that gets released. But there is, if you notice, there's no pump to wheels because now you've got hydrogen in the, in the vehicle and so there's zero emissions at that point. Um, same whether you do it with centralized or, there's actually a little difference because large centralized plants are more efficient than small uh, neighborhood uh, fuel station plants, but for, to first order they're the same. The interesting thing about biomass is it's net zero carbon. Uh, when you use it, you do release carbon, but when the plants grow, they tie carbon up, so in effect it's net zero. Um, and then if you use renewable electrolysis, uh, either PV or wind, it's about zero. And the thing you have to be careful about is nothing is really zero. Uh, if you use concrete for the, for the base of the uh, wind turbine tower, there are actually some greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. Um, we heard a little bit about this yesterday, the idea of the uh, uh, automobiles being used as a power web. I'm not going to speculate on whether that will or will not happen, but the, the numbers are interesting. Um, California is a state that has a lot of vehicles per capita, and it's also a state which is power starved. And so in California, it's not the 25% number like we heard about yesterday. If 6% of the automobiles in California had a 60 kilowatt fuel cell in them, that would exceed the generating ca capacity of every uh, generating plant in the state. So there's some kind of interesting numbers to think about there. Um, and again, this is just a bigger version of the kind of thing that uh, um, you might put outside your residence. There's actually 240 of these systems installed. They're not PEM systems, they're alkaline fuel cells. Um, no, I'm sorry, phosphoric acid fuel cells uh, made by uh, uh, what was international fuel cells, now UTC fuel cells. Those are being installed by people that cannot afford to have a power outage. A uh, 24 hour MasterCard processing center or something like that can afford the $4,500 a kilowatt install that those systems cost. We saw this one before, but I left it in here. I like it. Um, challenges. Uh, I was tempted to, to be a little flippant and say the top three challenges are cost, cost, and cost. Um, in effect, all kinds of problems can be reduced ultimately to some, some cost. But that's a little simplistic because. We do have issues with durability, reliability, um, um, some things about overall system performance, although the stacks are good, the systems have some issues. And then I'm not going to say much about storage and production and distribution because we've heard a lot about that and the next speaker will talk about storage. I also don't know why those turned out being crosses. That's obviously a font, <laughs> font difference here. Um, this will give you a little feel where we're at. Uh, we're actually in great shape in terms of the targets for uh, efficiency. And one of the things you can note is that the efficiency is higher at part power. That's a characteristic of the polarization curve of a fuel cell. And that's one of the things that's really nice about putting it in a vehicle. You spend most of your time at part that power. And so that's the place where you have the highest efficiency. Um, but they're still too, too large. They're too heavy. Um, these are actually very optimistic costs. And I should point out that this is status. You cannot buy a PEM fuel cell for $200 a kilowatt, uh, particularly including hydrogen storage. You notice here the hydrogen storage numbers aren't there because we don't know how to do it. Um, but the $200 in this status column is, is based on a, a projection. You take the existing technology, you make some assumptions about what happens in mass production. And so this is a, a projected cost for 500,000 units per year, which is kind of an automotive sort of volume for entry. Uh, but they, they still respond too slow. They have trouble with cold startup. 
um, they have trouble with cold durability, you got pure water in these things. It has to be pure. It can't be something that uh, has any kind of uh, uh, something that depresses the freezing point. So you have to do special things in order to keep them alive. And even this, I, I, I kind of debate the thousand hour durability, but uh, 100,000 miles is, is more like uh, 5,000 hours durability. Don't pay too much attention to the absolute numbers. I'm interested here in qualitative. And what I'm going to do is try and walk you through a place where I think it might be interesting to look at nanotechnology. Um, the taller bars are all reformate systems, so that's changing a liquid hydrocarbon into hydrogen-rich gas on board. The others are direct hydrogen. The thing to note is the direct hydrogen ones do not have the hydrogen storage in there. So if you had a, a reasonable cost for hydrogen storage, it's not that much different. But the one thing I want to point out is the purple bar is the cost of the fuel cell stack. In all cases, the cost of the stack is roughly half of the cost of the system or more. Um, and as we go into the fuel cell stack, now we're going to focus on this thing right here. It's the membrane with the electrode, catalyzed electrode on both sides. That's called a membrane electrode assembly. If we look at the stack cost, 70 to 80 percent of the cost of the stack is in the membrane electrode assemblies. So you got all this stuff, but you got these few pieces of plastic with platinum on them that are costing all the money. If you look at the membrane electrode assembly, and here let's look at 500,000 units a year, roughly 70 percent or so of the cost is in the catalyst. And uh, another quarter is in the membrane. So right there you sort of see that that's the tall pole in the tent. It's the one where you get the most payoff if you can have some impact on it. It's also the one where we've actually made the most advances over the years. It used to be that only NASA could afford to fly these things. We've managed to reduce uh, um, the cost of platinum by about a factor of 40 or 50, or the amount of platinum in a, in a fuel cell. But it's still not enough. We need another factor of 10 in costs. So let's look at an electrode. Um, the, the scale on each of these at the high end is about 800 nanometers. So we're looking at a, an electrode that's about a micron thick. Um, and these, these lumps, these particles you see here are on the order of, of six or 700 nanometers. Um, we call these fin, thin film electrodes, but they're really composites. And they're composites of carbon, metal, and polymer. Um, if we try to think about what's inside, what we've got is we've got supported catalysts. So we've got a fairly large carbon particle with a very finely divided platinum catalyst on it. And I'll show you in a minute the size of those catalyst particles, but you can see here the layers on the order of a mi uh, micron. Um, these little webs in here are meant to uh, indicate the ion conducting polymer or ionomer. So this, this is a fairly complicated structure. If hydrogen comes in here and wants to react with that site, um, you get the hydrogen oxidation. What you have to have is electronic conductivity for the electrons. So that's point-to-point -point contact in the, in the carbon. But you also have to have some of this ionomer close enough for that proton to migrate through the membrane over here to an oxygen catalyst site. Um, at the same time, you also have to have enough porosity in here so that the gaseous reactants can get in. Um, you have to humidify this because the, these polymers don't conduct unless they're wet. So this has to be basically, uh, let's see, hydrophilic. This has to be hydrophobic. Um, so they're, they're comp complicated structures. The catalysts we're using today have a particle size of about 3 nanometers when we get them from the manufacturer. Um, as received, they have an area then of about 100 square meters per gram. By the time we make this composite structure, and what we do is we solubilize the ionomer, and we put in solvents that evaporate, and we make an ink, and we put it on, on, a, on a decal, uh, then we hot press that onto the membrane. By the time you do all that, you're down to about 40 square meters per, per gram. Um, and you can measure that with cyclic voltammetry, where you look at the hydrogen adsorption desorption. But after you run it for a while, it drops well below that. And what, what happens if you look at these post-operation is that the catalyst particles have agglomerated. And so you've lost that. The nanoparticles didn't stay nano. But I think there's actually you know, some opportunity here to think about building these structures in a more structured way. 
what we need to do is we need to apply some science at our end to understand what the functions are required and how the thing works. Um, and then use that to design how the structure should be. To date, it's been pretty much applied science. You try something and see if it works better than what you used to do. I'm not going to talk much about hydrogen. Just to give you an idea, here's an idea of a, uh, a laboratory fuel processor. But just to give you an idea of the, the unit operations, the par partial oxidation, steam reformer, sulfur trapping, high temperature shift, low temperature shift, partial oxida or preferential oxidation to get rid of the carbon monoxide. This is the reason these things aren't on vehicles. Um, I just wanted to point out that, you know, the Gulf Coast of Texas is well positioned to be uh, a uh, nucleus of the hydrogen economy because you've already got hydrogen pipelines, you've got hydrogen generation here. Real, real quickly, um, current light duty vehicles in the United States take about 16 quads gasoline. Uh, if you assume a fuel cell is twice as efficient, uh, that gets you down to eight quads. And so just for grins, let's see what it would take to do half of the light duty vehicles in the U United States. We need four quads. That's about four million tons of hydrogen a year. Um, right now, there's about nine million tons of hydrogen made and used in the United States per year. About two thirds of that in the refinery business, about the other third in, in uh, um, food production to make uh, uh, vegetable oil solid. But to do that, 40 million tons is about 9 million tons, 95 million tons of natural gas. So that's uh, about 20% of the current usage. Uh, 310 million tons of coal, which is about a 25% increase. Uh, essentially, all of the agricultural waste in the United States, plus some, uh, some dedicated energy crops, all of the wind capacity of North Dakota, this class three or above, or a chunk of uh, New Mexico the size of the White Sands Missile, missile Range. Other ways, um, you know, a, a watt hour is a watt hour, but these are installed capacities. So you'd have to install 555 gigawatts of wind, which is, you know, 600 times what we got now, 740 gigawatts of solar, which is about 750 times that, um, or 216 gigawatts electric of nuclear. The other thing you can think about doing is uh, if you can do thermochemical water splitting, you need about 300 gigawatts thermal uh, to do that. So. On the web page, you'll be able to find some links. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Yes? Why do you need different amounts of electricity for the s to produce a hydrogen? What's that? The, you have different amounts of electricity necessary depending upon source. Oh, because those numbers were installed capacity, and so there's a capacity factor for each of those, which is kind of a U.S. average that gets multiplied by them. You need the same number of watts or watt hours, uh, regardless of what the source is. Okay, thank you. There's one. How is it you imagine that we'll ever get past this problem of freezing? The um, pure water problem. They will survive freezing as long as you don't let liquid water um, uh, be in a, in a con enclosed cavity. The membrane itself will actually conduct down to around minus 30 centigrade. It'll conduct ions because, because it's an acid membrane and the freezing point is actually depressed in the membrane. So the, the problem with startup from a very cold temperature is that as soon as you put dry gases to it, you're making product water on the... Uh, cathode side, and if everything there is cold, that product water is going to freeze. So I don't think we really have an answer to that yet, but it's pretty clear that the car companies don't want to build a 20-state a car. You know, they don't want to just sell cars in Florida and Texas and, uh, and parts of Arizona. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Long term, we can go to reforming fuel uh, in a mobile transportation system. Well, the nice thing about reforming fuel is that it's a great liquid fuels, hydrocarbons are a great hydrogen carrier. Um, but you do end up having then some emissions associated with that because um, you're using heat to reform the fuel and the carbon goes out with the tailpipe. 
Uh, what determines or what uh, limits the uh, life of the fuel cell? Is it the ionomer, ionomer or the platinum or how does it go bad? Uh, how does the ionomer fail? Now, how does the, what is the lifetime of the fuel cell? And what? Well, unfortunately, it's too short. Uh, right now, they fail early and they fail for different reasons. Durability is a big issue. You try to make it as thin as you can because thickness is resistance and that's a loss. So everybody's trying to make them thin, but then these materials creep. Um, they can also be poisoned. If you get any kind of metal ion in the system, it will take up an ion transport site. So you, these require a high level of cleanliness. And uh, right now, they, they're not lasting very long. Okay, great. Thanks Thank a you. lot, Jim. Uh, Jim Wong from Sandia at Livermore. Jim? <clears throat> um, thank you very much for inviting me here. I think everybody said they know the notice very short. I think I'm the last one because my name is not even on the list. <clears throat> but um, I had the advantage because if you know that how many nanotechnology meetings are going on the workshops, you should see the hydrogen meetings are maybe at least twice as much. And uh, <clears throat> instead of reinventing wheels, for a short time, I borrow a lot of uh, slides from uh, the similar talks from my colleague. So let me first starting to give them credit and also uh, put a disclaimer on. If uh, all the viewer graphs, you have questions I cannot answer, you know who to go for. Uh, let's start with this picture. I think, <clears throat> um, as you know, uh, President Bush talked about uh, this hydrogen initiative at the State of the Union. And what he really says are a few things. Uh, of course, the $1.2 million looks uh, pretty impressive. But in actuality, there's a lot of earmarked money already uh, in place. So the total increase is not really that great. However, uh, I think he's talking about the uh, <coughs> hydrogen for pollution free and also uh, for cleaner uh, 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 air and much independent of the foreign source of energy. But there's also subtle uh, implication here about the timing. I think his timing is talking about, about 16 years. For a person just born to become a driver, about 16 years. Uh, <clears throat> so what issues are we trying to solve here? Uh, mainly, I think, uh, to the politics, I think the first one is energy security. And we know the Iraq wars and other things that uh, really want to be independent of the oil if we can. Of course, the other things are the, uh, the uh, pollutions and the climate change. So, uh, why is hydrogen? Of course, it's abundant to a degree. It's, cal it's qualified. Uh, it's clean, efficient. Um, <clears throat> And also, it can come from a variety of uh, renewable energies, as you can see here. And you can do for transportation, as everybody wants to do. And then also for distributing generation powers. I want to say a little bit different stages uh, to say that uh, uh, hydrogen is not just for transportation. It's actually for all, all kinds of uh, power or electricity. It's, it's really is a energy carrier. So. If you think energy storage, and hydrogen is a storage in media. But anyway, uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, uh, in the conversion process, of course, uh, the fuel cells, but also in the uh, IC engines or turbines, you know, hydrogen combustion is also a transition technology. Before you totally become fuel cell sufficient, uh, the other transitional technology is still uh, very attractive. Uh, and also, uh, looking about the combustion, I just said, and then the uh, applications, not just for transportation, but also for electrical power and for portable electronics. So I'm talking about here, mainly is on the onboard uh, for transportation now. Because for hydrogen storage, uh, onboard, uh, just like uh, the previous uh, speaker said about fuel cells, it has much more stringent requirements. It has to be uh, small has to be uh, 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 very densified, like seen here. You, you can see here that the difference between 
uh, uh, hydrogen in volume metrics measure versus ga uh, gasoline, you can see the, the challenge is, is really great. Um, <clears throat> so uh, normally for automobile companies, they like to say 300 miles is a range. So that equivalent to four to five kilograms of hydrogen. All right, and if you think that's a uh, easy task, uh, let's see, okay. So what really is that how we can store this uh, adequate energy efficient, safe, and cost effective? I think this is a good, great picture. I, I gave me an uh, uh, analogy to uh, people first thought about the fuel cell, I mean the cell phones. Uh, I think I remember the story that people saw a guy with a cell phone you know, in the airport, very attractive, many, many years ago. And then he said, uh, what is the thing that behind you that you pull as a you know, at luggage? I said, that's a battery. But in here, it looked like you know, the gasoline, I mean, the hydrogen storage might be just that little baggage they have to carry if you don't do it intelligently. OK, uh, currently at DOE, after all those workshops, there's really uh, <coughs> come up with five different options here uh, in terms of storage. The most uh, uh, mature one, of course, is compressed and liquid get, uh, tanks. And the 5,000 to 10,000 PSI uh, tanks are being made. Uh, in fact, I was told in Europe the 10,000 uh, 10, uh, 10, PSI tank has been proved for safety use. Uh, <clears throat> the problem, uh, the things they're working on is the, the tank materials and also the, uh, the insulations and so forth. The second uh, um, mature one uh, is like the, uh, for the hydrides. And most recently, uh, the complex metal hydride, like the uh, sodium aluminum hydride, uh, promised to provide uh, four to five percent, away percent hydrogen uh, at uh, uh, moderate pressure and uh, near room temperature, about 100 deg uh, degrees. However, there's other problem with that. Uh, it, even though the four percent is attractive, but it's not uh, meeting the DOE's uh, requirements. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's, the, of course, the carbon nanotubes that has been a, a very controversial issues. Uh, previous speaker talking about uh, uh, there is still a debate is it really works or not. And I, I will talk a little bit more if I uh, have time. Uh, then uh, the chemical storage, we call it, is really the non-reversible uh, at this time. In other words, you can generate hydrogen as you need it, but then it's one through. Uh, to make it reversible, uh, take most time a lot of uh, energy to do it. And then there's uh, so-called advanced concepts. There's are uh, many, uh, I was told uh, the um, uh, <clears throat> brainstorm sessions in different sessions. I think uh, Professor Smurley has been attend one of them in terms of uh, defining what the advanced concepts are. And then there's also uh, DOE trying to set a standard uh, testing and procedure to make sure that everybody talking the same language. Um, just to show a, a few examples, uh, everybody knows what the compressed uh, uh, tank looks like. Uh, <clears throat> and they're actually very lightweight. They're made of uh, some uh, carbon uh, fiber uh, spawn uh, uh, tanks with some polymers uh, uh, inhibitors in there. And the, for the liquid uh, hydrogen, uh, the most problem is that the, the boil off uh, because uh, uh, you have to keep it cool and also the, um, the energy that used to uh, make it cryogenic is also uh, pretty expensive. So packaging and safety are key issues. Now for the uh, reversible hydride system, in here we show this uh, tech, tetrahydride, uh, aluminum hydride become uh, phase transformation into uh, 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 sodium hydride. Uh, it's really not like the metal hydride we used to know. It's not like the interstitial uh, materials. And this is more like a reaction, a solid, solid reaction. And so uh, if uh, for all the chemists that they know, uh, aluminum sodium hydride is really um, a reducing agent used for many, many years. It's re uh, non-reversible -re non until about uh, 96, 97, Dr. Uh, Bernalovich in uh, Germany 
uh, discovered that use of titanium uh, doping uh, make it uh, reversible and also with uh, reasonable kinetics. But the problem, as I said, is uh, if you can use a two-step to get up to maybe 5% weight, but uh, the DOE requires at least 6 weight percent, and also the kinetics right now are still not uh, uh, very, uh, very fast. Uh, the chemical hydrides here shows the three different examples, the boron uh, hydrides, the lithium hydrides, and the sodium balls, they all seem to uh, use the usable. And actually, there was a uh, automobile that uh, Chrysler has is Chrysler has been built using this technology with uh, Mendelian uh, technology. Let me show you an example here. Uh, <clears throat> for example, you use uh, all these uh, renewable energy to generate hydrogen and hydride the uh, sodium oxide. And then you uh, go through and uh, <coughs> use the catalyst with water and generate hydrogen. Uh, if you haven't seen this Millennium website, they show a very nice video that uh, with without catalyst, you can see the hydrogen generation that can stop right away if you take the, uh, the uh, catalyst away. Uh, it's very, very attractive, but the trouble is at the cost. Uh, if you consider the gasoline like a uh, dollar fifty or two dollars uh, a gallon, equivalent that this system costs at least fifty dollars or more. Of course, the nanotube is a very attractive one. Everybody likes to uh, make sure that it will work. Uh, currently, I think the official language is that uh, uh, up to four weight percent uh, has been shown, but uh, higher than that has not been uh, demonstrated or, or reproduced. Uh, DOE still like to continue working on it. Uh, I think there's maybe more controversy about uh, contaminations or other metal uh, as a um, catalyst that uh, absorb more hydrogen than carbon, but that's an open issue. So if you put it in perspective, uh, in terms of the maturity, and I said here, uh, of course, the uh, compressed gas and liquid hydrogen are the most mature one, and then go beyond. The alanates here is uh, make, try to make it work, and the nanotubes, uh, we think, is still far out. Okay, uh, back to reality. I think that this is the list that uh, uh, DOE officially blessed. And if you look at the uh, two major things, one is energy density, the uh, uh, watt hour per liter. This is a target. And then the uh, energy per weight is uh, like this. Uh, these are the ones that uh, uh, currently at, uh, I think, 2010, they tried to hit this. But beyond that, let's just look at uh, a graphic. It you know, may be easier to see. Uh, this is the target for uh, 2010, and 2015 is over here. These are the most uh, thing we just described, and none of, none of them are really meeting the target. And of course, uh, at Sandia, we're working on the composite metal hydride, and this still have a long way to go. Okay, uh, this is the, one of the workshop that they come with a long list of uh, blue sky materials. I think most of them, um, as myself working in the area for a few years, uh, I have a lot of doubts in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, for example, a few of them, uh, like the, um, let's see, I'm trying to, try to make enemies now. Um, for example, the, um, uh, the hydrogenated uh, office uh, carbon. I think uh, people using uh, this carbon uh, in the fusion business for a long time, and they have uh, a lot of experience of how hydrogen get into the carbon uh, first layer. And I was told the maximum they ever get, uh, the ratio is uh, one to one, one carbon to one hydrogen. And also take an awfully, maybe even not next to impossible to get the hydrogen out. And I, I just take the words for it. I don't know the details. But so even one to one uh, ratio, it's like um, maybe six weight percent maximum. So if you can do better than that, uh, well, that would be a magic but anyway, 
if you look at the hydride, that maybe is the most uh, promising one because if we know one of the non-reversible hydride can become reversible with catalyst, then maybe there's some other uh, hydride can do the same. And you can see there are many hydrides that do have a high weight percent. Uh, lithium boron hydride, uh, this is, uh, of course, there's a few interesting things. You look at the, the most best efficient I mean, store of hydrogen is methane at 25%. Just can't get it out. <laughs> And also, you look at, uh, there's the one for water, 11%, not bad. But anyway, there's some hope that if, I think the nano uh, technology in terms of catalyst will make this happen, and I think that's more realistic. Just a few examples, boron nitride nanotubes, people have been studied, and you can see that there are uh, way percent absorbing. I think, uh, Maybe this was, again, with catalysts or other things that may make it work. And also, another one, uh, zeolite. Uh, that just uh, one paper showing the hydrogen concentrations with uh, some of the uh, uh, sodium itching in there. Okay, again, uh, go back to Earth. You can see that even DOE's uh, target is really uh, very modest. Uh, this is the uh, picture from GM. Uh, this is the area they, this, they really marginally accept. This is what they desirable. This is where the um, uh, gasoline is. And you can see all the ones that we are showing here are in this corner, not even reach this. And DOE's target uh, maybe barely touching here. So. Um, I think this really goes a lot of challenges that ahead of us. <laughs> uh, but also we know that uh, for, for transportation, if you cannot store enough energy on board, it might, might as well just forget about it, right? So it's very critical. In fact, I think DOE put the hydrogen storage as number one priority. And, and actually it's a material issue. I think that plays right into the nanotechnology. And a lot of things, I think we go to nanoscale the property changes, and uh, you know, there's a lot of possibility. But anyway, the bottom line is, uh, timing is an issue. It really, I think, we're talking to GM, for example, uh, they said if you cannot make the storage works in the next couple years, uh, you forget about 2010. Uh, of course, the backup is they use the they try to use the compressed bottles, and that's the I think the <clears throat> Uh, people's perception maybe is more important in this case than anything else. If you can tolerate a uh, 10,000 or 20,000 PSI bottle under your seat <laughs> without saying thinking about the Hindenburg, I think that uh, you may be very brave. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Uh, have you considered the possibility to store the hydrogen into the uh, hydrogen gas hydrate? Hydrogen what? Hydrogen g gas hydrate. Water hydrate. Yes, water hydrate. Water. Like yeah, it's it's, it's like methane hydride. Yeah. Into into hydrogen hydrogen hydrate. The hydrogen can also form the hydrate. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I'm not understanding. <laughs> if, if it made a hydrate like methane does, yes. wouldn't that be nice, I think was the Oh, yeah, all right, suggestion. okay. But it yeah. doesn't make a hydrate like yeah, methane. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> does it really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I just have maybe a philosophical one. My energy density, hydrogen is 33,000 watt hours per kilogram, and diesel or gasoline is about 13,000. So if you took and got to 10%, an enormous goal, way above the DOE goal, you would be a quarter of the energy density of gasoline. And if you had a fuel cell being twice as efficient as an ICE, you would still only be half the range. Yes. 
So if you got to 10%, you would be half the range of an existing vehicle. Well, philosophically, shouldn't we just up the CAFE standards of existing vehicles? Yeah, it could be. But I think the auto company have different philosophies in terms of <laughs> <laughs> they want to sell a car to make sure that the customer will be happy with. Um, I have to say that uh, having watched your talk here, there's not a lot of good news in there. And uh, one of the, the I, I, something I've been kicking around for a while is that I think the news is even worse than that because a lot of these fuels are actually reasonably heavy and I think you lose some of the efficiency gains that you get from hydrogen. Exactly the same sort of thing. I mean, you just, you just lose because you have to carry the extra mass around. And the same thing happens. I don't, I don't know how much mass would be required for a 20,000 PSI canister, but it, it might be non-negligible. And uh, it just... You mean the weight of the tank itself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it, it, it's one of these things, again, the more we learn, the farther away it seems. And I'm just... Well, in I'm fact... just dispirited, I guess, is all I want to say. I think I, I view it differently. Uh, because it looks so um, uh, far out, I think the challenge is really is to the scientist how to make it... Uh, Possible. I mean, if it's so easy, why do we need us, right? <laughs> uh, that's the bottom line. <laughs> well, then is one point is one point two billion dollars going to cut it? I mean, come on. <laughs> but on the other hand, I, I think uh, uh, there are uh, possibilities uh, in the materials is, 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 is tremendous, and who knows that uh, the nano, the bucket body discovery, right? The nanotubes. I and mean, we haven't said about uh, five years ago, maybe 10 years ago. But so things could happen in those. So I'm very optimistic. And DOE is pumping more money into it. So thank you.